Well, good morning, Meadowbrook Church. How's everybody doing this morning? Excellent. Uh, it's great to see you here in person. It's great to see you uh, and welcome you online as well. Welcome to another beautiful Sunday morning at NBC. So like the video said, my name is Craig. I'm on staff here at Meadowbrook. And we are back in our Romans series this morning. We'll be finishing the remainder, the rest of Romans chapter 5. So I'll invite you to turn there now. Um, Romans 5 will be, verses, will be in verses 12 through 21, 12 to 21. So as you're heading there, uh, if you're not there already, I'd like to, you to think back to the first time or the first memory where you ever got in trouble. It might be jarring for some of you, but go back there and uh, think about the first time you ever got in trouble. Maybe it was something ser- serious, maybe it was something silly. And for some of you, um, it might have been a few weeks or a few months or a few years ago, depending on how many kids we still have in service. Um, so for me, it was when I was four or five. Uh, we were at the mall uh, with my entire family, so I'm the youngest of four, so all six of us. And we're walking through one of these candy stores like you'd see in a mall. It has all the containers with the scoops, and you could get them by the pound or whatever. And we're about to walk out the door. And I lift the lid of the closest thing to the exit. And I just grab a handful of, like, gummy worms or bears or whatever, sharks, whatever they were, and stuff it in my mouth. And I couldn't explain why I did it. I just wanted it. And so I did it. And we get back to the van. My, my dad had a big 90s conversion van. And I'm sitting in the back seat trying to discreetly eat the gummy things. And my family realizes Craig's too quiet. So every family's got a loud mouth. That was me. And my parents find out I had stolen candy. I had ate it. And we're already on our way home. And I received my first lecture, like scolding lecture ever in front of all my siblings. I remember feeling just the heat of shame and guilt just like ripple throughout my body. I felt awful. And that's the first memory I have of when I got in trouble. It's also ironically the first memory from what I now know of as what would be called sin. And that seems pretty harsh to put on, you know, a four or five-year-old a harsh word to put on a four or five-year-old Craig, but that's the reality of sin, is that it makes people uncomfortable, and it makes us feel awkward, and it makes us sensitive because it's something that we, it's a reality that we grapple with every single day. Right? We are sinful, and that is why we need Christ. So there's a wrestling between sin and spirit in our hearts all of our lives. And so that's one of the big topics, a uh, big part of what we're going to be talking about today is sin and working through this passage in Romans 5. So as I've been preparing for this Sunday, reading, studying, one of my favorite authors uh, and pastors is uh, a man by the name of A.W. Tozer. And I read a quote of his that was dead on and accurate to kind of what I wanted to look at and talk about this morning. Um, And I wanted to start the sermon with this quote in mind. So Tozer's sharing his thoughts on the Christian life. And he says, What we need to restore power to the Christian testimony is not soft talk about brotherhood, but an honest recognition that two human races occupy the earth simultaneously. A fallen race that sprang from the loins of Adam and a regenerate race that is born of the Spirit through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus. So there are two groups of people living in the world today. There are those people who identify with the world and, and the evil systems you know, uh, of government and, and those who are identified with the righteous government of God, right? So there are those who identify with sin and with death and those who identify with life. There's those who identify with and as in Adam and those who are identified as in Christ. So we've softened the blow of this to others in an attempt to be or seem more likable but in doing so, we act if there's no difference between sin and between righteousness. So this morning, we're going to read through Romans chapter 5. Uh, we're going to look at and walk through the reality that Adam defined our past. Christ claims our future. 
Adam defined our past. Christ claims our future. So please pray with me as we, before we jump in. God, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for this beautiful day of sunshine. We thank you for gathering us together as a, a body uh, that we can uh, worship, that we can celebrate, that we can uh, think of the things that you've done in our lives, that we can be here and present uh, with friends, with family, with loved ones, um, whether we've been a part of Meadowbrook for a long time or maybe just a, a few weeks or just a few minutes, uh, Lord, I pray that you speak to us, each and every one of us, through your word. Uh, let us be empowered and convicted by your truth. And let us turn towards Christ. Amen. Uh, so there's, I, I broke the passage uh, 12 to 21 up into three different parts. And I have it on the screen for you guys. Uh, we're going to go through verses 12 to 14 and learn how sin reigns over all. We're going to go through 15 to 17 and how we can reign in life through Christ. And then the last part, the last few verses of Romans chapter 5, 18 to 21, we're going to talk about how grace abounds more than sin multiplies. So follow along with me, Romans chapter 5, starting in verse 12. Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man and death through sin, and in this way, death came to all people because all sinned. Now, to be sure, sin was in the world before the law was given, but sin was, is not charged against anyone's account where there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from the time of Adam to the time of Moses, even over those who did not sin by breaking a command, as did Adam, who was a pattern of the one to come. So right away, verse 12, we see Paul uh, use the word therefore, and it's commonly heard in, in church or in sermons, you know, we ask the question, what is the therefore, therefore? Why is Paul using it? Why is he saying this? What does it mean? So the term therefore is connecting Paul's argument with the previous statements that he's already made, right? So Paul established that as believers in Christ, we are reconciled or reunited with God by the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. That's what Paul talks about in verses 8 through 11, right? So he's kind of finishing and closing that thought with the passage or the word therefore at the start of verse 12. So Paul's already established that as believers in Christ, we've been reconciled or reunited with God. So therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man. So the man Paul's referring to is Adam, the first man, the first human, the reason for the fall. If there's any Adams in here, I'm really sorry. I'm not talking about you. Um, Paul does not say that sin originated with Adam, but entered the world through Adam. So in Genesis chapter 2, 15 to 17, after God had placed Adam in the, in the Garden of Eden, it says, the Lord commanded the man, saying, from any tree, the tr any tree of the garden you may eat freely, but from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you, may, you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you shall surely die. So sin and consequently death make their appearance through the disobedience of Adam. So sin entered the world, and with it, you know, the ushering in of sin came death, and this spread to everyone. And a lot of us might ask the question, wait, hang on, why did it spread to everyone? How did it spread to everyone? Because all people sinned, is what the passage says. And how is it that Paul says that the first man entered the world? How did it say that sin enters through this first man who entered the world? It entered the world through the sin of one man, Adam, right? And whose fault is it, right, that we sin? Well, yeah, it's Adam's fault. But we as human beings and humanity, do we also sin and rebel against God? Yes, right? So we see earlier in this letter to the Romans, Paul refers to all of humanity has fallen short of the glory of God, Romans 3.23, right? And this is the origin, this is the overview of how humanity gained its sinful state. We see this past that Adam has defined for us, regardless of our input or not. Um, and so there's a cycle of sin that I, I put together that I just wanted to show you that we can draw out of this passage, right? We see the sin entering the world through one man, death entering the world through that sin, and then death spreading to all men because all sin. And so this is vicious cycle of sin. And we take it as a given that everyone sins. We call it by different names, but it has, you know, meaning is the same. Most people would say, you know, we all make mistakes. You know, the air is human, or I'm, I'm, only, I'm only human, or, or, or nobody's perfect, right? But that meaning is the same. People throughout history understand that human beings sin, but, but why? And here, Paul's explaining the answer. The answer is because 
all people sin because they're born sinners, right? Because Adam sinned, and sin reigns over all. So Adam sinned, and at this point, sin enters the world, and through sin, death also enters the world, bringing death to all people because all people sin. So we sin because Adam sinned. We sin because his act made us a sinner, and we sin because we are sinners. So Paul defends this in this first passage of Scripture, and I should say the second half of chapter 5, he starts talking about the law and the relationship to sin, right? If sin is rebellion against the law or breaking of God's command, then why do people continue to die between the time of Adam and the time of Moses is what he's referring to in the beginning of chapter 5. God gives this command to Adam, and he gives them, uh, he gave a lot of commands to, to Moses, right? But, but the, what about the people in between, right? Uh, there, there wasn't technically any law to break, but why was there death, Right. Paul's answer for that is Adam was this type of foreshadowing of Jesus who was to come. When Adam sinned in the garden, he was representing all of us or all of humanity. So I want to try and compare this with, with an illustration. So I have a twin brother. Uh, his name is Carl. There's a couple of pictures on the screen for you if you wanted to know what a twin looks like. Um, and growing up, like you expect, we shared everything. Nearly everything, and the most obvious one being uh, a room, uh, which is great. So now, young twin boys are not the neatest people in the world. So when our parents, our room would get quite messy, um, if not weekly, it was daily. And so when our parents would see our room with toys and clothes scattered about, do you think they cared which twin did the mess? Of course not. Right? Of course not. Boys, clean your room. It was our room. It was always our mess. They wouldn't go through and point to specific things and try to refer to it as one or the other. So it's our room, therefore our mess, regardless of whose item was whose. And one of us would cause the room to be dirty, and we would both have to take the blame. Right? So Adam defined our past. We were born into the reign of sin. You and I live after Adam. So though Adam and Eve were created without sin, you and I were born in sin, and Adam sinned, and everybody after Adam is contaminated and guilty, right? So we're born in the likeness of Adam with his sin, with shame, with death. Adam sinned, making us all sinners, guilty before God. And so we rebel against God because we're, we're rebels. And so this disease has been passed down from generation to generation. We all have it. Born guilty, born desiring to sin, and we knew that, you know, we're sinning. We might have called it a mistake, but we know that we've done something that we that we've ought not to be done. So Adam plunges the entirety of the human race into sin, and we all feel it, right? And so this is the point where Paul's making in verses 12 to 14, right? Sin reigns over all. Now, before we get too bogged down by the burden of sin, uh, let's talk about what Paul says next. Verses 15 to 17 and how, to, how we reign in life through Christ. Follow along, verse 15 to 17, please. But the gift is not like the trespass. For if the many died by the trespass of the one man, how much more to God's grace and the gift that came by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, overflow to the many. Nor can the gift of God be compared with the result of one man's sin. The judgment followed one sin and brought condemnation. But the gift followed many trespasses and brought justification. For if by the trespass of the one man death reigned through that one man, how much more will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace and the gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ? Verses 15 to 17. So this half of chapter 5, Paul is continually I should say that 12 to 21, he's continually using this analogy of, of two men and two acts. This is the only thing they have in common. Two men and their two acts. Everything else is entirely contrast. So Adam, whose sin ushered in death and ultimately all of humanity, and, and Christ, whose sacrifice, whose gift overcomes the sin and conquers death and replaces it with life. 1 Corinthians 15, 22 says it like this. It says, for as in Adam all die, even so in Christ all shall be made alive. 
right? And so like I said, Paul's using this analogy, this connection, these parallels between these two men um, throughout the passage. And so I, put it, I wanted to visualize this kind of verse by verse where he mentions this, that these differences between Adam and Christ. So this is a graphic I wanted to show you guys. The differences between Adam and Christ. And so we see, in, it starts with verse, verse 15, that when, where Adam brings death, Christ brings grace. Verse 16, where Adam brings judgment and brings condemnation, Christ replaces that with justification. Right? 17 is more death. Christ brings righteousness. And 18, there's condemnation. And Jesus brings that life, how we're to reign in life through Christ. And so where Adam brings, you know, sin and makes all sinners, God makes it, or Christ makes everyone righteous. Where sin is increased in verse 20, grace is increased in verse 20, and then 21. Where sin reigns, grace reigns. And so notice in the middle of 15, right? Here is the, the heart of the comparison. The, the words much more, much more. So this is that comparison I'm talking about. Adam did this, but Christ did what? Much more. Adam's act had this effect, and Christ's act had that much more. So we see the differences in effectiveness. The differences in effectiveness. Christ's act, Christ's sacrifice, Christ's willingness to die, overcome sin and death, and take on the sins of the world, right? His act had a greater effectiveness. If one thing came from Adam's sin, much more shall be guaranteed and assured in Christ. So if we know that to be true, how much more will we know that one thing done in Christ's righteousness shall have as, as well a great and even greater effect? So what Adam did to make us sinners can't compare to what Jesus did in making us righteous. Adam's one act, Adam's one trespass, one disobedience was enough to bring sin to everybody, condemnation to everyone. And the one act of Christ forgave and covered countless sins once and for all, and then much more, right? The free gift of Christ is not only freed humanity from death, but it also just didn't return them to the innocence of Adam. It took them out of death, beyond the innocence of Adam, to the righteousness of Christ. So it's much, much, much more, right? And, and Paul describes this in the, 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 words, the words and using the word grace. He says that what's offered in Christ, he says, is the grace of God by the gift of of grace. He uses the word grace so many times, but in a particular way. The grace of God is expressive of, of an attribute or characteristic of God, right? Or the attri- a- attitude of God. And then it, it says that the gift of grace, that, which comes because of God's attitude. And so, in other words, through Christ, God's grace, which is an inherent attribute of his nature, is expressed to men in the gift of his grace, which comes to them by Jesus Christ. So, by one man, comes the gift of salvation and justification and righteousness, which displays God's attributes of grace. So it's this free gift of God's marvelous grace. The Bible talks so much about the grace of God and and think about how thankful we can be for that grace, that though our past was defined by Adam, our future is now claimed by Christ. And so we're going to look at the, the last few verses in Romans 5, 18 to 21. Consequently, just as one, ma- one trespass resulted in condemnation for all people, so also one righteous act resulted in justification and life for all people. For just, uh, for just as through the disobedience of the one man, the many were made sinners, so also through the obedience of the one man, the law, many will be made righteous. The law was brought in so that the trespass might increase. But where sin increased, grace increased all the more. So that just as sin reigned in death, so also grace might reign through righteousness to bring eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So Paul continues this Adam and Christ analogy. If we can go back to the comparison between Adam and Christ. Right? Adam's sin is labeled as a trespass. Right, um, and we can see that that trust that trespass. This idea of trespass can be uh, translated to con- con- convey the idea of falling aside or of going astray. So Paul takes Adam's act, contrasts it with an entirely different one, an act of righteousness. Right, where Adam's sin, Adam's trespass leads to condemnation. Christ's righteousness leads to only not only justification, but it leads to life. Right, and Paul.
talks about this discussion and continues this discussion of the law. And people sinned and died before the law came. When the law was given to Moses at Mount Sinai, what happened after the law came? Sin did not decrease. Sin did not go away. It increased. That's what Paul says in the back half of chapter 5. So there are two things meant by this statement. One, the law came to reveal sin to us, which is the purpose of God's law. And this is discussed later in Romans chapter 7. The law reveals our sins to us and also causes us to run to Christ and to show us our need for him. Now, people knew right, they were sinning, but sin also increased in another more sinister way. It increased in defiance of God. So as people see and understand God's law, they defy God's law and sin anyway. So in the face of such awful rebellion, what does God do? Right? He has every right to crush all of humanity in, in punishment for, for their rebellion. Right? People ask the question all the time as a big stumbling block. Why is there so much evil and suffering in the world? Right? Look around. In order for God to remove all the evil and suffering in the world, we'd have to remove the entirety of the human race. Just chuck planet Earth into the sun. And then evil and suffering is gone. Right? That is what God could do and um, has every right to do. But what does God do? Paul says, 20 and 21. But where sin increased... Grace increased all the more, so that just as sin reigned in death, so also grace might reign through righteousness to bring eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. This is it. That's, that's the good news. That's the gospel. That although we were dead in our sins, our past was defined by Adam. Our future is claimed by Christ. Eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. The grace of God comes to us and does more than just repair of what Adam Lost. It doesn't just take humanity back to where it was before the fall. It takes them through innocence to eternal righteousness. And so it says it has abounded. By trusting in Christ's finished work on the cross, his righteousness overcomes our sin. Not by our own efforts or by our own work, but Christ's work. The effectiveness of Christ's gift is greater than Adam's offense. I was trying to picture and visualize this and come up with a way to take really dense theological passages and just try to like grapple with it and understand it with, with it. Ironically, um, I read in a few commentaries that said this passage is some of the heaviest theology in Romans. So thanks, Brian, for going on spring break. Um, <laughs> just kidding. Uh, I, I enjoy this. It's really good. So here's, here's um, an image, an artist's interpretation of what is kind of happening. Again, it is a piece of art. It's an artist's interpretation, but it's powerful, and it's thought-provoking on reflecting what is happening in Romans chapter 5, right? So where, Christ, for where Adam's act brings sin and death and, and condemnation, Christ's act brings restoration, reconciliation, redemption, and eternal life. So sin reigns. We can see it all around us. We see rebellion and sickness and death. And those things reveal the fact that sin reigns and this is continuing to spread. And how do we know that sin reigns? It's because people die all the time. And I don't think death is a part of God's plan. There's nothing in the world I hate more than death. And my mom never told me, told me never use the word hate, but I hate death. And therefore, I should hate sin. But grace reigns through the righteousness to eternal life. Sin reigns and brings death, both physical and eternal. But Christ has defeated death. He's conquered the powers of hell, and his salvation is greater than the condemnation. And so he brings eternal life to all who trust in him. Right? This is the great and the glorious salvation that's brought, where Paul says, through Jesus Christ our Lord. So for those who haven't believed in Jesus, who, is, who are exploring, who are wondering, who are curious, who are questioning, who are wrestling, you ever feel like you've sinned you have so sinned against God that you cannot possibly be brought into his kingdom and saved from his wrath and from his justice. 
God's grace is bigger, right? God's grace is bigger than your sin. God's grace is bigger than Adam's sin. And in those sin reigns, we see that evidence. Christ reigns over it. His grace is more abundant than the sin of the worst sinners. He brings abundant grace to anyone and everyone who trusts in him. So all who believe receive this abundant grace. They receive justification. They receive righteousness. We are sinners who actively rebel against God. So we, were, we are deserving of his wrath. We are deserving of, of his justice. And this is the status of every person. We are born in Adam. And so when we trust in Christ, we are in Christ. And those who are in Christ are saved from that punishment for sin. We are plucked out of that damnable mass of humanity and declared righteous. And so for those of us who call Christ Savior, I ask these questions because there are things that I go through and struggle with as well. Do you think Christ willingly took on the cross for us to continually live in sin? Do you think Jesus Christ died and was buried for us to continue for us to carry the burdens and the sins of our past? Do you think Christ overcame sin and overcame death just for us to think that our sins are greater than his righteousness? Absolutely not to all of that. For the Christian, Adam defined our past, but Christ claims our future. So I want to close with a story, and hopefully this story will turn into a challenge. So just like little four-year-old Craig, um, Kelsey and I didn't have to teach our children how to sin. They just do it. <laughs> they are inherently disobedient, which is a majority, uh, basically the majority of what parenting is, is navigating disobedient children. And so, for example, um, I don't know if I have any pictures of the kids. Do I do? Go ahead. Um, those are my children. Um, Leo, Leo is... Uh, eight, eight months old today. Nine, gosh, Kelsey's going to kill me. <laughs> eight or nine months old today. Um, uh, Lincoln, Lincoln is in the middle. He's two. Lila, my little peach, she is four. And so, um, cute, sinful, but cute, that's hard. Uh, so our two-year-old Lincoln, cute and sweet as can be, but as much of a boy, um, he's just so, such a boy. <laughs> he's this rough and tumble little man. Where our four-year-old Lila was sensitive, um, Lincoln can also be sensitive, but he's much more solid and destructive in his sensitivity. Um, my wife found Lincoln on top of a table, just standing on top of a table. Kind of like that picture you see him. Um, but he's standing on top of a table. And she, said, and she said, Lincoln, you know you're not supposed to do that. Please get down from there. He turns to his mother and he says, I'm not falling. <laughs> and, I'm, I, oof, and Kelsey's telling me this after the fact. And I was like, Rrr. I don't know what I would have done in that moment. So sin manifests itself in different ways. Um, and kids, from general disobedience to lying to stealing, hurting with words, hurting with physical actions. Adults, too, are steeped in sin. We just have more practice at hiding it or excusing it. So this is something that my wife and I, there's something that I want to share with you that is part of the story and also the challenge I wanted to, to hopefully bring about. Um, something that my wife and I learned recently, I've been trying to trying to practice in our children, that we've intentionally tried to speak into our kids' lives, particularly in sinful moments where one child that's hit another, that happened this morning, <laughs> or another child said something to intentionally hurt their sibling. And we look them in the eye, and we say, that is not who you are. So we have opportunities to speak the truth of Christ's love and forgiveness into kids' sinful behaviors. And the hope is that we can point them to him instead of sin. 
And we can help condition their identity as made in the image of our loving and powerful God. And the interesting thing is, the more and more I remind my kids that their sin is not who they are, the more and more I'm, I'm reminded of that same message. When I lose my temper over the tiniest little thing, that is not who you are. The selfishness that creeps up when I don't have what other people have, that is not who you are. When I'm haunted by the sin of my past, that is not who you are. How many followers of Christ need to hear that declaration daily? The struggle of living a godly life in a fallen condition is real. It's hard. Paul talks about it in terms of war. Jumping ahead to Romans 7. Paul says, Now if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who do it, but it is sin living in me that does it. So I find this law at work. Although I want to do good, evil is right there with me. For in my inner, for in my inner being, I delight in God's law, but I see another law at work in me, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within me. What a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? Thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then I myself, in my mind, am a slave to God's law, but in my sinful nature, a slave to the law of sin. Our past does not define us. Our sin does not define us. Our flesh does not define us. Christ defines us. Christ defines our future, and Christ defines our hope, and Christ knows us, and he calls us by name. He knows who we really are, and we are his. We are a son or a daughter of the king. We are forgiven. We are freed. We are redeemed. We are dead to sin, and we are alive in him. Uh, Please join me in prayer. God, thank you for this morning, for this gift that has overcome the trespass of the sin of, of our past. God, for giving us a daily reminder and daily opportunity to know where our identity lies, where our hope lies. I pray that we don't live in the past, but we step into the future that Christ has claimed for us through his life, death, and resurrection on the cross. God, your son overcame all of those things and ascended and was glorified and is king over all. I pray that we trust in him, the hope that he gives and he offers to us, that we're not bogged down by the things of our past and our wrongdoings and haunted by the temptations of our flesh, but that we abide by the Spirit, and walk in the Spirit of the Lord. God, we love you. We thank you for this morning. We thank you for what Christ has done. We pray this in his mighty name. Amen.